we've been trained from birth to think about borrowing as much money as we can for as long as we can at the lowest interest rate possible. And that makes sense if you're buying a house or a warehouse, right? Um, it doesn't make sense if you're buying inventory because if I borrow today's inventory needs with a two year payback period, well, what happens when you're sold out of inventory at the end of the quarter? You, you need more. And, and now you actually haven't finished paying back that first loan for inventory that sold last quarter, and yet you need to go get more money for this quarter. And so really one of the things that we try to help people understand is, is that it's taking that spreadsheet, right? Like how does money come in and out every week? What's up, everybody, and welcome to Organize Chaos Live. I'm Chris Ronzio, your host, and this is another installment of the show that's helping you elevate your business. And the reason I say elevate is because I'm up in beautiful Flagstaff, Arizona right now. My hat has the actual elevation, just over 7,000 feet. And when you think about elevating your business, making your business more mature, more sustainable, maybe you think of one of the biggest problems that a lot of small businesses face, which is getting their finances finances under control. Maybe you've been in a position where you didn't know where your next payroll was going to come from, where you didn't know how to finance the growth strategies that you dreamed up on the whiteboard. And today we're going to talk about some of those issues and ideas and how to make sure that the finances in your business are solid, which is something that I know is on a lot of our minds in those last couple of weeks with the market. So today joining me, we have an expert on the topic, Eric Youngstrom. And Eric is the founder and CEO of a group called OnRamp Funds out of Austin, Texas. So we're going to invite Eric in here in just a second. But before we do, I'd love to hear in the comments, in the chat, in the, whatever platform you're watching this on, let us know what are some of the common financial challenges that your business is facing or that you think other small businesses might face. So take a minute, put those in the chat because I wanna hear and tailor this presentation around the challenges, the financial challenges that your business is facing. And while you type those in, let's welcome in Eric Youngstrom. Hey there, how are you doing today? Eric, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So where are you calling in from? We're, we're calling her from Austin, Texas. Um, I'm, I'm guessing what, 300 feet above sea level, not quite 7,000. <laughs> A <laughs> little different, a little different. Yeah. I see. I have to get to 7,000 altitude to get away from the heat in Phoenix right now. It's like 120 degrees. So I drive up here. I think we're actually a cool 99 today. The last few days have been over 100, but that's just Texas in the summertime. Man, but, but you've got a nice lake out there in Austin, don't you? A lot of them. Yep. Yep. And we take advantage of them. That's cool. All right. So we'll probably have some people commenting in here in the chat and asking some financial questions. And while they're thinking those up, can you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and what kind of took you to OnRamp? Sure. So I've been helping build software companies now since 2004. Uh, I, I've been blessed to have been in several that have had successful exits. Uh, I typically in the past joined as really kind of one of the first employees, if not the first employee. Um, brought on by the founders. Um, and this time I, I had an opportunity to actually found my own. I was really, really excited to get a chance to do that and um, really did it based on spending nearly a decade in the e-commerce industry with a company called Shipping Easy. Uh, we launched Shipping Easy in 2012. We provided really an order aggregation engine where you could see all the orders you had at Amazon, eBay, Walmart, Big Commerce, Shopify. And then within that, you could ship all those orders with all the different carriers. Um, and so it was just, you know, it was a great product that really helped the small business owner operate far more efficiently. And it, we were probably about six months in when we actually had a, one of our small business owners call us and say, hey, thanks to you guys, I can quit my day job and actually make this my business and my livelihood, which wow. is just a, you know, it's a fantastic feeling, right? To, to know that you're a part of somebody's journey and, and to get to help them along that path. Um, and, you know, over the 10 years we were there, four years as an independent business and another six under stamps.com, we, we were acquired. I just got a chance to work with hundreds of thousands of these small business owners and, and wanted to build a product that would meet their needs for the long term. Um, and, you know, what better product than helping them with their finances? Yeah. So is this a problem that you saw just kind of over and over again in your experience working with small businesses or, or, or why, why financial uh, for your next business? Well, you know, the, the joke about shipping was it was the ass end of e-commerce um, and there was no such thing as an aspirational shipper because the aspiration had been beaten out of people with everything required to get to your first order. And um, when I was kind of thinking through that, I was like, what better 
what better next job than let's be the carrot at the beginning of that train than than at the end of that train. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, and what we saw with shipping was we would have customers with good orders, but they didn't have the cash on their credit card to ship that next order. And all of a sudden they were having, it was, then it was a chargeback or a refunded order uh, because they just couldn't get it out the door. And so when we, when we saw this time and time and time again, it just really kind of presented there was an opportunity to go out and solve that problem, right? That there was a, there's a better product for that than a credit card. Um, and there's a real need for it. And there's a need for somebody to go purpose build that solution specifically for the e-commerce industry. So as you're saying this, I'm thinking about uh, last week, I was at dinner with this entrepreneur that has kind of a fashion e-commerce business. And she said that she has eight, a waiting list of 8,000 customers wanting to sign up, but she doesn't have the financing to be able to go and get the inventory. And so she's exactly in that spot. So as we go through this conversation, she's the avatar in my head that I'm thinking about, but I wanna dig into what are the biggest financial challenges that small businesses have to overcome? So I, I know we've got some shared notes here. I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to just start taking us through them. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you're starting a business, the first thing you have to do is just have the savings on, you know, your own personal savings necessary to pay yourself while that business is getting to a point where it can generate the free cash flow necessary, that there's actually profit um, and the cash flow that can come out of that business to pay yourself. Um, so I'm going to assume, and for this conversation, that that our that our listeners have kind of that mentality in place. But then after that, right, you have to have enough capital to go off and buy your inventory, launch your launch your online store, um, get a payment gateway, take photographs of your products, right, build the merchandising out around that, and, and really actually have your catalog available for somebody to come place an order, and then. You know, beyond that, you then start to think about things like if, if you're going to do your own manufacturing, do you need to buy equipment, right? Do you have to have a, you know, do you have to have your, do you have to have a conveyor belt? Do you have to have, I don't know, ovens or or um, sewing facilities if you're making clothing, right? That kind of thing. Or are you going to outsource that? Uh, and so then finally you get to your finished goods inventory and what do you have on hand to actually pay for that and then drive the advertising the shipping and fulfillment costs so that you can turn that inventory over. And what we see in the industry, right, is um, there's really a need for different types of capital. Um, you can think about long term capital. This is almost bringing investors on who are going to have a, a stake in your business, right, owning equity. Um, you can think about kind of midterm capital. Do I need to buy a, a forklift from my warehouse? Right. I'm going to pay that off over two to five years. And then you think about working capital. And that really is capital that turns over, you know, every two to let's call it 18 weeks. Um, so really high velocity capital. And what we know about the e-commerce segment, especially for the SMB, right, let's call it businesses with less than, say, $5 million in revenue, that a lot of the profit that the business owner would live on, would use to pay their own salary, is actually it's there from an accounting principle standard standard. But it's not there from a cash flow standard because it's getting put back into inventory, back into advertising, back into shipping and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And it's not there actually to go pay your mortgage, right, or to buy dinner for your wife tonight or that kind of thing. And so what we've built is a product that really solves that one that one working capital piece there. But there really is needs across all, all three of those kind of stacks, the long term, the medium term and the, and the short term. So I, I think you make a great point here. And I, I want to. I want to just emphasize this for people that are just getting started in business, if they're listening and, and they're just trying to figure out how to cover their own uh, salary needs. You know, a lot of people will leave a job and they'll have that security of a paycheck. And then their first priority is how do I make enough money to scramble and get that paycheck back? And if they're in a service business, it's a little bit easier because you cobble mm -hmm. together some services for time. But it sounds like what you're talking about and what OnRamp focuses on with e-commerce is more a, a product space, right? And if you are producing products, there is a long cash flow cycle to being right. able to buy the equipment, buy the supplies, the raw materials, the labor, produce this stuff, store it, hold inventory, sell it, market it. And then you finally, at some point, get to cash the checks and, and put them back in the bank. And so um, for anyone that's listening, I think this is a great education on what it takes to build a product business because it's not easy. It's not. It's not. You're exactly right. We are. We are exclusively focused on those e-commerce businesses that are producing a physical product, right? Something that converts the uh, the digital into a physical set of steps and delivers a product that's made of atoms, right? That you can touch and hold. 
Um, and, and that does have a cash conversion cycle, right? You have to go buy inventory. It might take a month for that inventory to get, you know, to your warehouse. It takes a couple of days to break it down. So it's in the component pieces. You can ship one at a time and then you have to generate those orders, right? And that order comes in. Great. I've got to, I've got to go take that iPhone case off the shelf, put it in a box, put a shipping label on it, give it to a carrier. A couple of days later, it gets to my customer. Um, you know, if it's Amazon, I might be another 14 days before that deposit hits my bank account. If it's Shopify, it could be three or four days. Yeah. Um, and then great. I've, I've now sold one unit of a thousand that I bought in bulk for inventory, but I got 999 to go. And it's probably not till the last hundred units are sold that the profits actually generated that can come back out of that business. But when you're down to your last hundred units, well, you need to buy the next thousand or you're going to run out of stock before, you know, you're not going to have stock when, when you sell the last hundred, right? So it's that, that cycle, that turnover cycle that we really exist to go support. Um, and, you know, I think there's a real need for that. And, and when we do that, what that unlocks is the profit of that business that can then flow back into that, that business owner's bank account, right? It becomes then that profit then becomes salary. They can pay themselves and they can decide, is it all salary? Or should part of that go into growing the business? But now, you know, if I've got a million dollar business with a 15% profit margin, yeah, can I take out a hundred thousand to pay myself and put 50 into the business alongside, um, alongside what OnRamp does to grow faster? So I, I, I want to dumb this down even more. And let's, let's say someone's starting a business and, you know, a, a common thing when you're starting a business, sometimes you borrow money from friends and family, or sometimes you go out and you get an SBA loan and you get like this lump sum of cash that you may use for all of the short-term, mid-term, long-term purposes that you described in the, in, in the beginning. And so do you think that that is just a less sophisticated business owner? Or is that what someone has to do at the beginning in order to get mature enough to pick the right different sources of capital for the right costs in their business? I think it's a bit of both, right? I mean, I, I think you you do have to kind of look at what your own personal assets are and, and friends and family is a, is a great uh, method, right? If you've got everything dialed in and, and you can go work with friends and family to, to raise capital, tell how you make those early investments. But eventually you also have to understand what is that turnover cycle, right? From, a, from, your, from whatever product is you sell, What's the cycle from? I, I go place this order for raw materials, converts to finished goods, converts to in my warehouse, converts to sales to my customers, and then enough is back in that I can then go rinse and repeat that cycle, right? Yeah. And so, you know, an SBA loan is 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 a good approach to that. The challenge is most SBA loans are are not available to you when you're just starting, right? There actually needs to be a couple of years of track record and financial statements and things like that. Um, friends and family are great for that. Your own personal savings are great for that. But you have to have a plan that says, how do I keep this, this engine turning over? And if, if you haven't planned that part of it out, that's where we see a lot of small business owners struggle. Yeah, I remember early on in my first and second businesses, you know, when I was just getting them started or even even this business, third business of mine, um, I had a spreadsheet that was kind of week by week cash flow, you know, dollars coming in, dollars going out. How how is the bank balance changing week over right. week, forecasted, you know, 12, 13 months into the future? Do you think that that's like the, the most basic thing for someone to start with or, or you know, what does someone need to have figured out? before they're even mature enough to have a conversation with your company? I, I think they need to understand that, right? We have customers who come to us who don't understand that. And, and what ends up happening, and it, it's an unfortunate part of America, right? But we've been trained from birth to think about borrowing as much money as we can for as long as we can at the lowest interest rate possible. And that makes sense if you're buying a house or a warehouse, right? Um, it doesn't make sense if you're buying inventory because if I borrow today's inventory needs with a two year payback period. Well, what happens when you're sold out of inventory at the end of the quarter, you, you need more. And, and now you actually haven't finished paying back that first loan for inventory that sold last quarter. And yet you need to go get more money for this quarter. And so really one of the things that we try to help people understand is, is that it's taking that spreadsheet, right? Like how does money come in and out every week? Um, and advertising, you know, that money flows out, but it generates demand that then turns over kind of on a two to six week basis. Shipping, right, you're, you're spending that based on demand that was created by that advertising dollar that now an order exists. That turns over on a kind of a three to a three day to 21 day basis. Yeah. And then inventory, 
right? In normal times, COVID times are different, right? We see a lot of variation without inventory, but in normal times, inventory is kind of a 60 to 120 day turnover cycle. Hmm. So it's really helping people understand that pay it back as it sells is actually a, a far smarter way to run working capital than maybe an SBA loan with a two year payback period. But if you've spent it too soon, then you don't have it when you need it. And if you're holding on to it and waiting to spend it each quarter, well, now you're paying interest on funds that you're not going to deploy for 90 days or 180 days or 360 days. Um, right. So that comes to the cost as well. Right. So can you walk us through the mechanics of how your product works? And, and I'll just share, you know, what, one of the things we did early as, as a SaaS company, software as a service company, is we were able to use our recurring revenue, our monthly recurring revenue to get some debt financing uh, to go and get those customers. And it, it had a similar sort of payback mechanism, but I'm curious if you could just explain yours for any e-commerce sellers out there. And I think even if people aren't in e-commerce, just the, the, the insight that these types of vehicles are available could be applicable to their business. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's take kind of an easy example, uh, inventory financing, right? So inventory is one of the line items that we like to go finance. Let's just assume you sell, I'm gonna use, this iPhone case is an example, right? You sell these things, let's say 25 bucks a pop and they cost you five and, you be, and you're gonna sell a thousand in the quarter. So you go borrow $5,000, you get a thousand units in, and now you know every day you're getting a few of those sales across the finish line and at the end of the quarter, you're gonna be sold out. And if you need a month headway to get that next thousand in, that means at day 60, you need to go get the next thousand units. You need another $5,000 to bring it in. And so what we suggest is if you think about working capital finance is every time you sell one of these units, you actually pay five dollars down on that line so that by the time your 90 days is over, that full line is paid off as you've sold. Right. So now if you think about borrowing, what you haven't done is tied up your own five thousand dollars in inventory. You borrowed for that. And then every time a unit sells, that's when you actually incur the cost of inventory. You incur that $5 cost, but you've done that when $25 is coming in for this, you know, for this case, having been sold and shipped and delivered to that customer. And you've got a happy customer, you've got revenue, and you've reduced your, your, your financing exposure on the back end. So just really thinking through how does money come in and out and how do you pay it in the cycle of that, which is different than, say, financing, a, um, you know, a, a truck or a, um, a forklift or a warehouse where it's not tied directly to sales. It's going to help sales, going to help you sell, you know, scale your business. But that's something you pay back over two to five years with, you know, more like automotive payment terms and things like that, where it's just a different mentality of, of that asset value. Right. It's not an asset that goes away, whereas your inventory right, is an asset that is only an asset on the books while you have it in stock. Once it's out of stock, it's gone. So don't carry a cost of it post sale. Hmm. So it, it, it almost reminds me of maybe this is oversimplifying it, but Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank, you're receiving, you know, talking about the royalty structure yep. of, you know, I'll lend you half a million dollars and you pay me back a dollar per unit until you've paid back six hundred thousand dollars or something like that. Is that is that a, a too too simple? It's not too simple. It's a, it's a great way to think about it. Right. But it, in our case, what's a little bit different, right, is it's not a royalty. It's your inventory costs five bucks a unit. We've given you five bucks a unit for it. But as it sells, then make sure you're paying that five bucks back so that what's not happening is you now have a, a, a financing cost that you're still paying down, but there's no asset against it. Right. And he's thinking about that a very similar way. Right. It's just that his asset is he's bringing the Mr. Wonderful brand. Right. And, and trying to help you drive those sales. And that's what his royalty is for. And so, you know, sometimes his royalties are in perpetuity. I imagine that with any kind of debt vehicle, there is some kind of interest rate. And so do you calculate that on a so like an APR basis or, you know, a cost of the funds over the, 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 the working capital period? Yeah. So because we're because we're high velocity and because, you know, we're working with small business merchants that that really haven't hit kind of the criteria to start working with banks and things like that. We're, we're not the lowest cost capital. Uh, we don't pretend to be. Um, we are what we what we are is very, very cost effective capital. So um, our merchants tend to, uh, and business owners tend to borrow roughly 20 to 25 percent of their expected 90 day revenue. And they're using they're using that to pay for the inventory and then to fund shipping and fulfillment and advertising. Um, what we do then is charge a fee, uh, typically about 1% of the actual sales value. 
while that loan is outstanding is paid in fees. And so kind of one to 1% on, on 20% of that actually revenue you're, you're borrowing. And the reason we do it this way is, uh, you know, we've run different you know, scenarios, but it's a really easy way for, for a business owner to think about 100% of my revenue generates my 15% profit margin. I'm going to borrow 20% of my revenue, right? So I'm going to borrow almost hundred and what is that? 133% of my profit I get from on-ramp. For that, I'm going to give on-ramp 1% of my profit. And so now, hey, I had a 15% profit margin business. Now I have a 14% profit margin business. But what I really have on that 100% of revenue is that cash available. And so if that revenue is going to be, you know, 500,000 this quarter, those guys just gave me $100,000 in cash and I was only going to generate $70,000 in profit. That's a good trade. Right. I can go now. Now I have my salary out of the business. I have money to go put back in the business. I can go put some money away into savings, maybe, you know, pay college tuitions for kids, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what we really saw that one of the impetuses for this is if you look at a lot of the the big aggregators, right, the guys who raised what was it, 12 billion dollars in 2021 to go buy all these small e-commerce brands and roll them up into bigger companies. What they're really offering is kind of about 75% of annual EBITDA to about 200% um, of your profit. And what they knew was these, these business owners were so exhausted of not being able to get the profit out of the business, they would take these low ball offers. And what we're trying to do is go back to that business owner and say, don't. If you could actually get that profit out of the business and pay yourself, would you ever stop running it? And you know, if your ambition is that you wanna go build a billion dollar brand, then we're gonna be with you on along a part of that journey, your early stage until you can scale into a bank and we're excited for you uh, that you've graduated out of us. And if your guy says, look, I, you know, I, I want a lifestyle business. I actually don't wanna spend all my time working. You know, I get a million dollars in revenue and $150,000 salary is enough. We're happy to be that, that guy's partner forever. Um, right. Cause you know, what, what our goal is here to help you achieve your aspirations, not to tell you what that aspiration should be. Well, I, I think it's definitely something that everyone listening needs to consider is financing their business and their growth with debt. A lot of people want to finance that growth or their their billion dollar dreams through a VC or private equity. And so right. um, how would you say that something like this, a vehicle like this compares to the decision to bring on partners in the business? When might people want to bring on that kind of capital uh, and a partner versus bring on the working capital to fund their inventory? Yeah, I mean, it, that, I think it's a personal decision, right? Like, what kind of control do you want? You know, what, what, you know, how many VCs really are available to e-commerce business owners? Uh, I, I think, you know, it's probably less than 5% of all e-commerce businesses get e-commerce or get venture capital funding. Now, there's probably a whole lot more, right, to get friends and family and, and those people become your partner, right? And they have a stake in the business, but it's different than bringing a VC on. Um, you know, I, I've heard stories about Under Armour that, you know, those guys use capital very much like OnRamp's working capital solution until they're about $200 million in revenue because they looked at it and said, hold on, yes, we're paying, you know, we, we pay a high interest rate for that capital, but the cost of a VC investor is somebody on my board who will forever own a percentage of my company who gets to, you know, have a say in how money is spent and what our business does and how we grow and what our ambitions should be. Uh, and that comes at an incredibly high cost, right? Equity is incredibly expensive to sell to investors. And there are, there are good reasons to do so, right? OnRamp is a, is a venture capital backed um, company, right? We have, we have employees and things like that. And we have big ambitions to go help the SMB, but it's not always the right choice. Um, and so it's really important for that business owner to decide what is the right avenue for them and to really understand the market for what they're doing. Yeah. And I think the way you broke it down at the beginning and thinking long term, mid term, short term, what is the use of capital is an important frame to think about this through. Because, you know, if you're trying to invest in something that's going to be years and years before it comes to fruition, then maybe you need a partner that's willing to take that ride with you. Whereas if you have a very specific use for the capital, your ad spend, your inventory, then why wouldn't you go find some source of capital to keep growing the business and make it worth more while you re re retain full ownership? So, you know, very similar story that we went through. You know, our, our first couple of years were, were debt finance. We grew the business to millions of dollars before bringing on partners and had to give up a lot less of the company as a result. That's right. No, I mean, it, it's exactly right. If you can go generate those returns and get revenue and whatnot, you know, the, the more revenue you have, the closer you are to being profitable, 
the more control you have over what type of equity investor that you bring in. Right. Uh, because, you know, let's face it, with $1 free cash flow, you don't need an equity investor. You may not get to grow as fast as you'd like or as fast as an equity investor might allow you to, but you also haven't given up any of that control, right? And somebody who's owned 25 or 50% of your business. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, the question you have to answer is what, what are you building for? Yeah. All right. So we've only got a few minutes left and we tease this as kind of the, the biggest financial challenges that small businesses face. And so if we were to summarize this up or leave the audience with a few tips, are there a couple of takeaways that you would leave them with on things that they should be getting squared away in their business or researching or thinking about? Yeah, I think, you know, number one, it's just making sure that you're thinking of the different levels of the capital stack and using those appropriately. Don't use long term capital for short term turnover because you want to paid it back when you need more. And don't use short term capital for long term things because you have to pay it back way too fast. And and what are you doing with that? So I think really understanding, you know, when when is you know mortgage debt for a warehouse right? When is working capital for inventory right? When is equity right with partners for really having an investor who's not looking for a short term payback? Um, really understanding those things. And the rest of it really is then dialing in your books, really, truly get your accounting dialed in. Um, it's worth spending a lot of time with your bookkeeper in the early stages. So you really understand all aspects of your PL, of your balance sheet. And most importantly, and the, and the most overlooked one is the cash flow statement. Uh, because once you really understand how those work, then your bookkeeper who might only need to spend eight hours a month on that can come back and look at, you know, you can look at those forms with them over an hour or two a month. Um, because you made that early investment that if you don't, man, then every month just becomes a grind trying to understand what's going on. Yeah. Great tips. Early on in my business career, I had a part time CFO that I would meet with every week and he would show me those financial statements for my business. And it was so helpful to get that education and understand my chart of accounts and be looking at the spreadsheet. So a lot of entrepreneurs get in business and think, oh, that's the thing I don't want to do. But really understanding how your business financially works is a smart move. It's something you have to do if you really want to scale the business, I believe. I, I absolutely agree. And it's something I've spent a lot of time building on ramp is really helping build out our accounting standards and approach. And what it means now a year in is that I spend a lot less time doing accounting and more time just getting to sit down with our part time CFO and really review what's happened in the business um, because I because I made that early investment. And trust me, it's not an investment I wanted to make. It's, yeah. it's not where I want to spend the time, but it's just an important part of it. And then, you know, as we think about what's going on in the current market, right? Like, um, you know, last year was the, the largest VC investment year in history, right? Um, double the year before, which it almost doubled the year before that. That that world's changing, right? We're, we're, we're kind of looking at a, a bleak couple of years ahead of us right now, based on at least what the current economic indicators would say, right? In terms of going to recession. Um, it's, it's really time for people to just look at how do they, how do they survive through a recession, right? Which um, it's unfortunate, but recessions are an important part of an economy and an economic cycle. Um, and so, you know, what are your capital sources? How are your inventories turning over? How are you managing your books? Um, being very disciplined in spending. There are great businesses that are built in, in these types of times, but they, they do so with a disciplined approach, right? Almost, uh, you know, I think in when capital's cheap, think about last year, people were spending two months in advance. I think what's going to happen now is you should be spending about a half month behind schedule, right? Like hmm. really proving everything's working, knowing that when you when you put dollars into an advertising campaign, you know exactly what's going to come back, having the instrumentation built into that so that if it's, you know, if, if all of a sudden your cost per click is going up, is it still going to be a valuable sale or not? And if not, pulling that money out and then redirecting it, maybe Facebook becomes the more cost effective channel, right? Or LinkedIn yeah. or somewhere else. Um, but managing those things, you know, with laser like precision uh, is really going to be rewarded in these in these times. Such great advice. So instead of spending two months ahead, maybe spend a half a month behind. Uh, I think that's a very practical tip. Uh, Eric, I know you spoke a little bit to the macro trends. There's a lot going on right now, but people Lots. need more options uh, for for this kind of financing. So if they want to learn more about on ramp funds, where, where can they find you? www.onramppfunds.com. 
Um, we're also on Facebook. You can find us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we're, we're trying to be everywhere you are. Um, and we also have a sales team here. So uh, our phone number is on every page of our app. You can always call in and we have advisors here ha happy to help you think about you know, what type of capital you need and, and if we're a fit for you or not. And our goal is not to push money at people or our goal is to be a partner uh, and to join uh, our small business owners teams and, and kind of be a, a partner to them and a team member to them to help them achieve what they're looking to, to do in the, in the markets today. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Eric Youngstrom on Ramp Funds out in Austin. Give him a shout. Uh, learn more about how you can finance your business. Really, you know, this this like we've been talking about is a crazy environment that we find ourselves in and keeping our businesses afloat with cash is the lifeblood of your business. Can you make payroll? Can you pay for inventory? Can you still afford to go out and get new customers? Can you pay your own mortgage and pay your own paycheck? You know, these are important questions that a lot of small businesses are asking themselves. So do yourself a favor, educate yourself, and uh, and and you can start uh, with, uh, with, I'm glad you started with us, but Eric, thanks for joining. Hey, thanks for listening to Organized Chaos. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, or share it with anyone in your network that you think could benefit from this information. For episode show notes, podcast recaps, and tons of other small business news and inspiration, check out the manual. That's trainual.com backslash manual.